Live from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, Florida, NBC News covers the flight of Columbia. The shuttle begins. Sponsored in part by Ford and your Ford dealer, who invite you to test drive the EXP, America's new personal sports coupe. Here are NBC News correspondents, John Chancellor and Tom Brokaw. And good morning, and with Tom and me here is Joseph Kerwin, the astronaut whom we last remembered on Skylab 2. Good morning, Hi. Dr. Kerwin, if I may say so. Uh, the countdown is uh, going on now. We're currently in a hold. We expect that the shuttle Columbia will take off from Cape Canaveral here in about 50 minutes. Everything has gone very, very well so far. The astronauts are in the spaceship itself. They checked on their heartbeats a few minutes ago. Their heartbeats are 75 beats per minute, which really shows people who are, it seems to me, not very excited about what they're doing, although they must be. Mine would be about 150 if I were there. Uh, behind me, you can, it looks as though it's dark, but it actually, we've had to tint these windows here so that um, outside, it's a nice dawn, it's just beginning, and the weather here, Tom, is really pretty good. Well, they had a great concern about the weather, as you well know. There was a little drizzle overnight, but uh, that's gone away, and the forecast looks very good. They're concerned about the weather for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons that they're concerned about is that they may have to bring it back if it doesn't go well on launch and land it here at Cape Kennedy. And if it does go well, and they landed at Edwards Air Force Base in California, they want to make sure that the weather's good at that end as well, because it's due to land on a dry lake bed. And it wasn't very long ago that that dry lake bed was underwater. So they've had a limit of 10 mile an hour or 10 knot uh, crosswinds here, and they've had a cloud cover limit of about 50%. We're well within that range here this morning, and they're also looking at some other sites as well. We have Frank Field standing by outside, and he's going to give us an update now on the weather situation here at Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center. Frank? Well, Tom, the uh, space flight meteorologists and the Air Force meteorologists are all going for good weather this morning. As a matter of fact, at the launch pad itself, directly over 39A, one can see what looks to be a dark series of clouds, a blanket of clouds that's about 2,500 feet. Well, that's a thin layer of clouds that extended inland, and that's what gave us the light drizzle. But that is also dissipating. And overhead, now we have some light cirrus. But to check all around the Cape itself, we can go to the radar, and the radar, which is fed to us through WESH, HD, uh, NBC affiliate, shows that just off the Cape itself, clear skies and all the way around those little bright spots you see just to the north of Daytona Beach, well, that indicates false echo. So there was no rainfall within 200 miles of the Cape itself. So at the Cape itself, our winds will be light. They'll be out of the southeast, two tenths of cumulus at about 3,000 feet, maybe three tenths of cirrus. Those are the high, thin crystal clouds that are up at about 20,000 feet. At the primary landing area, as you mentioned, Edwards Air Force Base, we expect that the winds there, too, will be light. And within all the parameters, three tenths of cirrus, that's good. The winds also will be light at White Sands Northrop Strip. There, the winds will be out of the northwest with light cirrus clouds, about three tenths. Again, the visibility will be excellent. So all points are proving out very nicely. It's a textbook kind of weather. The other areas around the world at Kadena, which is in Okinawa, not too good. They've got cloudy skies and rain, showers, and that will persist, but we're not looking for any problems there. Hickam, partly cloudy. Rota in Spain, another landing site, partly cloudy. So all in all, the weather is shaping up nicely. Should prove to be no problem. Gentlemen? There are just uh, maybe millions of people here at Cape Canaveral. Tom Brokaw had a terrible time getting here this morning. Uh, had to drive on the wrong side of the road at one point. Robert Bazell, our science correspondent, had to hitchhike and walk all the way out here. It's 25 miles from the hotel. Uh, the roads are just jammed with people waiting to see this launch, as we all are. And we'll be back with more coverage of the launch of the shuttle after this. NBC's coverage of the first space shuttle will continue in a moment. Saturday, join Barbara Mandrella. Meet Bill Donahue. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. In my next life, I want to be Reggie Jackson. I do everything at about a five level. I don't distinguish myself at anything, but I enjoy everything I do. If I get one par each nine, I'm happy. Actually, I don't have a bad swing. The problem is I can seldom find my ball after the swing. Life is full of all kinds of traps. The secret is to figure out how to get out of it. Donahue, weekdays at 9. Do you know the minimum wage is $3.35 an hour for most workers? That's a mustard. 
And I get time and a half for every hour over 40. Did you say 3.35 an hour? No, I said pass the mustard. You get time and a half for every hour over 40? No, I get the chicken salad sandwich. If you're doing work covered by the federal minimum wage law, you're entitled to all the benefits. Ask your boss. She'll tell you all about it. Or contact the Wage and Hour Division, U.S. Department of Labor. There's more. The heart of New York City. There's more. The Bronx and Stony Brook. There's more. The Meadowlands and West Park. There's more. Our Slope and Sandy Hook. There's more New York. You know all the places. There's more New York. You never miss a spot. There's more New York. We cover the bases. There's more New York. You know where it's time. Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center, and the astronauts are fully loaded into the orbiter Columbia. They were up at about 1.30 this morning after going to bed yesterday afternoon at about 4.30 p.m. Among other things, they have to change their circadian rhythm in the final month before liftoff. So they've had a good busy morning already at this hour. Let's get an update on what they've been doing now from NBC's Ike Siemens. One of the hardest and most dangerous parts of the countdown occurred early this morning. Columbia's fuel tanks were filled with volatile gases by remote control. It was brought off without a hitch around 2 o'clock Eastern Time, just about the time that astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen were waking up. They went to bed at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. After a 10-minute medical examination, Young and Crippen were joined by space officials while they had steak, eggs, toast, orange juice, and coffee for breakfast. On board Columbia, They'll take in 3,000 calories a day by eating rehydrated food, heated by an electric food warmer they'll bring with them. Future space shuttle crews and passengers will dine from a galley. Next, the astronauts got into their new shuttle spacesuits. They're lighter and easier to move around in than the ones worn by astronauts on earlier missions in space. Technicians found a minor air leak in Crippen's helmet. It was fixed on the spot. A short time later, Young and Crippen left in the van so familiar from other space flights and headed for launch pad 39A and the White Room. There, the closeout crew got them ready to enter the shuttle. This was the moment the two astronauts have been waiting for after three years of training to fly Columbia. This will be Command Pilot Young's fifth flight into space. For Crippen, his first since becoming an astronaut in 1969. The pre-launch procedures appear to be going very well, and all systems seem to be go. Even the weather is cooperating. It's clear there's little wind and no rain as liftoff approaches. Ike Siemens, NBC News, at the Kennedy Space Center. Joe Kerwin, what happens if something goes wrong this morning? There are a number of plans that we know of, but the first one would call for the astronauts to be ejected in seats from the... That's right, from uh, launch to about 120,000 feet. Should something really serious go wrong, uh, I and mean, it'd have to be more than an engine failure, they eject. From 120,000 feet up to staging or separation of the solids, uh, their only recourse is to do a quick separation, fast sep, from the stack, and then try and get the orbiter off, uh, probably ejecting subsequent to that, because they wouldn't be in the right position to make a landing. That's a very unlikely occurrence. After staging, they're in the return to launch site abort mode. And any time out to about four minutes and 20 seconds, uh, they can turn the thing around. Uh, dump, all the, dump all the fuel tanks. Well, what they do is burn and start the turn at such a time that their velocity back to the cape is right about the time the external tank is virtually empty. And then they separate from the tank and glide back to a relatively normal landing here at the cape. And then finally, they could, they could go once around, couldn't they? They can abort once around, and we have a new abort mode, this in-between. It covered an abort gap between the end of return to launch site and the beginning of the once-around abort into the Holloman Air Force Base, and that's Rota, Spain. We now have the capability to abort to Rota uh, between 
four minutes and approximately uh, seven or seven and a half minutes. The weather is not terrific there this morning in terms of the winds, though, right? It didn't sound too bad. The uh, the winds were out of the uh, south-southwest. They weren't too strong. Uh, the clouds were scattered with an occasional rain shower in the area. Uh, it's a good backup to have in your pocket. I think they're fairly tense out there this morning at this hour. You've been there before. Uh, their attention is, uh, has been captured by this. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about their heart rates. Their normals uh, are around 60, so 75 indicates that they're interested in what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. As John was just saying a few moments ago, we've got an incredible traffic situation going on around here. It's a kind of combination of Woodstock and Smokey and the Bandit, as it seems that everybody with a car, camper, bus, motorcycle, uh, whatever piece of vehicular transportation they have, they're all on the same road trying to get to a viewing site. We're going to go now to Jim Cummins, who is keeping track of this at a place called the Nassau Causeway, where a lot of the workers in this project have been invited to view the launch this morning. Jim, what's the situation there now? More than 50,000 people have gathered here on the bank of the Banana River at the Kennedy Space Center this morning to watch the shuttle launch. Many of the people here are shuttle project workers and their families, veteran uh, launch watchers, including Cliff England, who is standing here with me. Cliff has worked here at the uh, Space Center now since 1964 and has seen something like 50 to 75 launches. Cliff, I noticed this morning that most of these people sat in traffic jams for hours to come out here and see something that will last less than two minutes. Why do they come out for that? Well, most of the people here are uh, avid space fans. Their families, their husbands or their wives, they, uh, their children work for the Space Center. We feel that the uh, National Space Agency, who I work for, is, is proud of this project. We feel that the national uh, prestige of going into space is, will be added to by this uh, space shuttle. Do you expect to see anything different here from all the, all the launches that you've seen in the past, anything different here than today? I think it'll be a little bit different than the Saturn V going up. I think we'll see the solids go up a little bit faster, but I think we'll still see the same reaction. The cloud of smoke, we'll hear the thunder of the the big rocket that comes across this water it just thunders across here. It shakes your pant legs. It's like every 4th of July that I've ever been to rolled into one. We're going to try to show you here. We are about five miles away from the spaceship Columbia, which is across the bay here, across the river and across the marsh. We are told that there are people, VIPs, who have a closer vantage point, something like box seats at a baseball game. If so, these people here are sitting in the bleachers, but they don't mind. John? We are now in a planned hold 20 minutes before launch. The clock has been stopped. You can see the spacecraft on, on pad 39A there. They are getting the computers ready for the firing sequence. That's done by computer. The chase planes are ready to take off and follow the spacecraft as it goes into the air. And they are readying the computers for the flight program. And we expect that something in about 35 to 37 minutes now, as that man we just heard said, you will see every 4th of July you ever saw <laughs> rolled into one. We'll be back with more after this. Why do we call Fairmont the Great American Family Wagon? Just ask the Wileys, the Careys, and the Gultos, the Lawsons, O'Toole's, and the Mitos, the Williams, the Golds, and Iverson, the Jacksons, the Whites, and Andersons. Great mileage, great looks, and great room for the money. It's made our wagon the best seller in America, and it's helped make Ford Fairmont the great American family car. Here in the sea, billions of years ago, life began an odyssey that will reach across space and time. I'm Arthur C. Clarke, speaking for Omni Magazine. I know that even the sea is not eternal. But the life it spawned will survive, for man's destiny lies among the stars in the endlessly unfolding universe of Omni Magazine. Omni, the multi-award winning magazine of science, fact, and fiction, on sale now everywhere. 
outside, the Canon NP200 may look like any small copier, but inside there's a world of difference, a world of micronic, where 20 copies a minute are not only possible, but made reliable with a microcomputer. Fiber optics precisely defines your image, and a toner projection system gives you clear copies on virtually any paper. Up to 11 by 17, compact in size and price, the Canon NP200 is definitely worth looking into. With my arthritis, getting in and out of the tub can be frightening. But with arthritis strength bufferin, I can ease the minor pain for hours, move better. It gives me extra strength when the arthritis first flares up. But arthritis strength bufferin adds extra protection from stomach upset ordinary aspirin can cause. Sure feels good to have the extras of arthritis strength bufferin. Arthritis strength bufferin. Extra strength, extra protection. The uh, planned and scheduled hold of the countdown clock is still going on here at Cape Canaveral. The liftoff is still scheduled for 10 minutes of 7 Eastern time, and the people are coming from all over the United States to see this thing. We took some pictures of them this morning when the light got good enough. There you see the road and just thousands and thousands and thousands of cars uh, that uh, we were able to observe here, all kinds of people uh, out there waiting for the launch, which is due to come now in less than 45 minutes, about 40, uh, about, sorry, a little more than a half an hour. Everything going well here, and in Houston, Roy Neal is there because they'll be running part of this flight after liftoff here at the Cape. Roy, are you there? Yes, indeed, John. I hope you hear me. I know I certainly hear you. Matter of fact, I'm wearing two headsets this morning, as I will throughout the flight. I listen to Mission Control and the astronauts in this ear. I hear you in this ear. And at the moment, I'm seated in our NBC flight deck simulator, which is a rather fair reproduction of what the astronauts themselves have to work with in the cockpit. This is probably the most complex cockpit ever devised by man. And uh, if I were John Young and Bob Crippen at the moment, I'd be on my back <laughs> looking up at the sky like this, because that's the position of the spacecraft. And those are my windows over there. Now, of course, if I were in the actual cockpit, too, if I were John Young, I'd be on the left seat, sitting over there. And uh, the most obvious thing that you see are two objects that won't be used during this portion of the flight from John's seat. That's the hand controller in the middle and a speed brake uh, brake control down to the left side, also rudder pedals. Uh, that's actually, those are the devices that will be used to fly the spacecraft on orbit and uh, for landing purposes. But uh, I'll be in Bob Crippen's seat over here, the pilot seat, and one of the things that these men are working with right now are the computers and their computer controls here on both sides. Uh, these spacecraft, the space shuttle, fly by computer. The astronauts actually punch up controls into the computer for the most part. The computer then does all the work of driving the hydraulics, which in turn make the control surfaces work. Uh, to see what your computers are doing, there are cathode ray tubes, television tubes, if you like, that are prominently displayed and that carry the output of computers as well as almost anything else the astronauts might like to look at in terms of readouts that their instruments and meters don't give them. And, uh, oh yes, uh, here's a rather important feature. One of the things they hope will not happen is that red lights like this should not go on during any portion of this flight. Those are master alarms. When they go on in the spacecraft, there are horrible noises as well to alert the astronauts to the fact that something has gone wrong. So we'll punch off the master alarm, hope they don't see it, and take a look instead at Mission Control, which is, of course, the, the big reason that we are here in Houston. This is Mission Control right now. The flight controller's in place. Uh, Neil Hutchinson is the main flight director. He would be in the forefront of your picture. There he is, right there. Neil Hutchinson wearing his beard and ready to go, controlling the flight controllers as they go through the final stages of countdown this morning. To his right, and not visible in this NASA-provided picture, uh, would be Joe Allen. Capsule communicator, they still call that big spacecraft a capsule as far as mission control is concerned. And Joe Allen has done this thing in the past. He is one of uh, three Capcoms, as they're called. And this is one of three flight teams. They'll alternate in eight-hour shifts, and they'll be on duty around the clock. Mission control here in Houston will actually assume control of this mission uh, about the time the spacecraft clears the tower. And at that time, the big map in the center of mission control that you can see in the upper left-hand corner of your picture 
will become activated. All those round circles that indicate to us where the tracking stations, the ground stations worldwide are to be found, will start to flash when the spacecraft is in contact with them, and we'll see a little animated spacecraft fly around the world. That's what we're hoping for, and that's what we're standing by for here in Houston. John? And we're standing by with the clock going once again, John. Program known as Major Mode 101. Yeah, we're, this is the terminal can you countdown hear? configuration. This uh, we're we're seeing the count now at 1928. The count resumed just about 30 seconds ago. It was in a 20-minute hold, and now it's back underway once again. Now there'll be one other count if you're watching this, and that's not that's also built into the schedule later. So that one other hold, one other hold. Sorry, uh, later on. But all this means is that we're still on schedule, and that the planned hold that they had taken, uh, they took. It looks good for as they were saying for the scheduled liftoff at 6:50 a.m. Uh, that's in just a half an hour from now, so there'll be another hold coming up. When Roy was showing us the cockpit there, there are 2,000 displays, I think, altogether in that cockpit. And there are, what, over 100,000 uh, switches that they'll have to toggle at one time or another, or that they could toggle if they had to yeah. at one time or another. And little red lights that go on just as they do in your car, yeah. giving you a sinking feeling as well. The, uh, the, the astronaut of the future, of course, Bob Crippen, is supposed to be a great expert on software. That's the stuff that goes into the computer. That's what happens. They no longer wear the silk scarves. They now come out and they're experts on software. We'll be back with more on the launch of the Columbia Space Shuttle after this. NBC's coverage of the first space shuttle will continue in a moment. Every day, approximately 5,000 Americans turn 65 years old. For some, it's a new beginning, an opportunity to learn skills and develop talents they never knew they had. When is a person too old to get the most out of life? If they're really mature, the answer is never. Celebrate the prime of your life with us. I'm Pia Lindstrom. And I'm Joe Michael. Don't miss our enlightening new series, Saturdays at 7 on Channel 4. Our magazine, it's about everything you'd ever want to know with everyone you'd ever want to meet. Gary Collins will entertain you, inform you, and Pat Mitchell with the stars. We make every hour count for you. Next, the Tri-State Area's first newscast live at 5, packed with exclusive live reports and interviews. Live at 5 has that special journalistic spice that keeps you coming back for more. Good evening, I'm Sue Simmons. I'm Jack Cafferty. Welcome. This is Live at 5. Over the Weekday afternoons at 4, our magazine, then Live at 5. Bet you can't watch just one. This man walks into millions of homes every day. My being on Channel 4 in New York is a significant professional achievement for me. We benefit from the fact that uh, nobody else is doing what we do. One of the nice things about having your own talk show is you get your own library. Everybody who writes a book wants to be on our show. So do people who don't write books. I would have quit work to come and see him. <laughs> I didn't plant them. I'm real good at picking them, though. The Pick of the Morning, down to you, weekdays at 9. I'd come to see you if you had a show. When I grow up, I'm going to work in the firehouse. Me? I'm going to Hollywood. I want to be like him. Toby is a guide dog for the blind. Toby was the best, so he went to school at Second Sight in Smithtown, Long Island. Second Sight dogs are trained and given to their masters for free. So Toby and Second Sight rely solely on your help. Can you see a way to help in Second Sight? Send your contributions to Toby, Second Sight, Smithtown, New York, 11787. There are so many things that are unique about the Columbia Orbiter, but one of the most important features, of course, has to do with the surface down here, because when it returns from outer space and it comes back to Earth at about this configuration, it will generate an enormous amount of heat here on this surface. And to deal with that heat, to make sure that it doesn't burn up in space, NASA developed a special kind of tile spun from Minnesota sand into a silicate, and there are about 31,000 of these that are pieced together and then bonded on to the Columbia Shuttle Orbiter. And they were put together by a computer. It's kind of like a large jigsaw puzzle. This was a problem for a time. They had a, a, some trouble with some of them falling off in one of the flights when the, uh, one of the shuttles was transported from California here to Florida. And then they also had some other trouble with uh, just finding the right kind of binding, the glue that made them stick on. But now they think they're in pretty good shape. They can withstand temperatures up to 2,500 degrees. Most of the heat is absorbed into the interior of this tile. So it heats up like that, and they say, although I've never done this, and this one is not heated up, that you could pick it up by the corners, even though it's been heated up to 
2,400 degrees altogether. So that's one of the things that they are concerned about, but they figure that they have now licked the problem or they wouldn't have it out there on the uh, launch pad and ready to go. But we'll be talking a lot about these tiles in the next couple of days. Well, and the tiles have not been the only problem. Troubles with the propulsion system have also caused some, caused some delays and some cost overruns. Robert Bazell has put together this report on how the shuttle's propulsion system works. The space shuttle requires four separate propulsion systems. Two are needed to lift the craft off the pad and into orbit. The other two are used to make navigational corrections in space and to change the shuttle's flight attitudes. The long cylindrical solid rocket boosters provide 80% of the initial thrust on launching. The boosters are 150 feet long and 12 feet wide. The fuel inside them looks and feels like hard rubber used in typewriter erasers. When it ignites, here's what happens. The instantaneous blast brings the booster to its full three million pounds of thrust in one second. The main propulsion system, the cluster of three rockets in the tail, is the most powerful ever built in its size and weight range. The engines each develop 375,000 pounds of thrust. Because they can swivel on their mountings as much as 21 degrees, the engines are a steering mechanism as well as a propelling device. It is the main engines which are the first to ignite on liftoff. They are soon joined by the solid rocket boosters. But the boosters are burned out within two minutes. They are returned to Earth by parachute and retrieved for future use. A series of mishaps has plagued the engine since the beginning of the project. The worst being this complete flame-out in which the main engines burned up and fell apart during testing. But subsequent work brought them up to a high degree of performance, which was demonstrated in firings conducted on the pad at Cape Canaveral in February. Robert Bazell, NBC News. And so John Young and Robert Crippen, the crew of the spaceship Columbia, are in their seats in the, uh, on, the, on the flight deck of it. The computers are being readied. The engines of the chase planes have been started. The countdown is underway. The seat belts are fastened, and they should be going in about 23 minutes. We'll be back with more after this. Hi. Hold it. Nobody gets in without a mugshot. <laughs> Follow the noise. Polaroid's new Time Zero is the world's fastest developing color film. There you go. Oh, good. Seems like you see these pictures as fast as you take them. Use them as place cards, and everybody who's forgotten his name will know just where to sit. Not necessarily. What does that mean? Well, what if they forget what they look like? Well, that's what the pictures are for. I'm Arthur C. Clarke, speaking for Omni Magazine. On the first day of January, 2001, the second millennium ends and the third begins. What kind of world will greet that first day of the new era? This is the world of Omni Magazine. From the creation of new life forms to the conquest of the stars, Omni focuses upon the ultimate frontier towards which man must inevitably direct the infinite resources of his mind. The new world car, Ford Escort, now shows you another face. The sporty Ford Escort SS. It shows its stripes, pulls with front wheel drive, handles with rack and pinion steering, smooths with four wheel independent suspension, informs and invites. The sporty Ford Escort SS, built in America to take on the world and doing it. Just one place where you can go from high school to flight school, the Army. Today's Army has more pilots than the largest airline. Not bad for a rookie. You may wonder what these 
uh, earphones are, we're listening to uh, the shuttle launch control, and we'll be hearing some of that in just about a minute and 10 seconds when they announce the next planned hold in the countdown. There's another hold on the way, on the schedule. In the meantime, the uh, Joe, they're, they're having a bit of difficulty comparing the backup program on the computers. Is that something we ought to worry about very much? I don't think so. Uh, they should be able to uh, uh, fix it during this planned 10-minute hold. They need the backup computer, of course. They have four prime computers all in one set, and then they have a backup computer with totally different software. When they brought it online, they found that it wasn't listening to two of the four strings of data coming across from the, uh, from the prime computer. They're trying to, to re-initialize it so that it's listening to all the data, and then they'll press on. Why don't you describe for us just how those computers settle arguments among themselves of the four primary computers? Well, they vote. They, they, they do it very democratically. And if three of them vote the fourth one out, uh, he shuts himself down and goes and sits in a corner and pouts. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I interrupt you. We're, uh, we want you all to hear the voice of Hugh Harris in Launch Control. You'll be hearing him a lot. Here he is now. T minus nine minutes and holding. This is shuttle launch control. And that was. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, I mean, we have lots of missing data because of the strings being down. What specifically are you asking for? Well, we're looking for. We're looking for uh, anything with a down arrow on it. Something that would give us uh, a clue as to why it did not pick up those strings. This is shuttle launch control. An announcement follows in 30 seconds. What they're talking about, uh, you heard Joe Kerwin uh, told us about it. It's the dis it's the one computer not listening to the information being fed to it. Uh, it's probably getting in there somewhere, but they've got to find out why. We do not at the moment regard that as a very serious problem. Yeah, I, I doubt that they'll launch in this configuration, but I doubt that they won't get it fixed either. It's not a mechanical problem. No, no, no. It's a software problem. Yeah. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus nine minutes and holding. We have had an indication that a comparison of the backup computer programs in the orbiter has been conducted again, and the outcome is satisfactory. So at this point, we have no constraints that we know of for a liftoff on time at 6.50 a.m. this morning. This is a final 10-minute build-in hold, and when we come out of this, we will go into those final nine minutes of count down to launch at 6.50 a.m. This is shuttle launch control. Well, and that's the situation. They say they've got the computer um, communication problem fixed. I must say, as an innocent to these things, it didn't sound to me as though they had it fixed, but they know far more than, uh, than I do about this. We would now like to show you some animation of the launch itself, which is due in 17 minutes or so, an operation that must go perfectly and precisely if the mission is to succeed. Here is Roy Neal to describe it for us. The main engines using liquid fuel fire first. Seconds later, the solid fuel booster rockets join in. The gravitational pressure on the crew will reach three times Earth gravity. As the shuttle reaches 2,700 miles an hour, the solid boosters burn out. 16 small rockets are used to blast the pods free. After they're jettisoned, they parachute into the ocean to be retrieved. After eight minutes, the main engines cut off. The big tank disconnects from the orbiter and drifts off into oblivion. Eventually, it'll burn up on re-entry. The Columbia is now 70 miles above the Earth. Smaller maneuvering engines will push it to a speed of 17,500 miles an hour. In orbit, finally, the Columbia will be controlled, turned this way and that, by small reaction control thrusters, some of them in the tail pods, others in the nose. 44 reaction control system thrusters in all. Roy Neal, NBC News. As you might expect, a lot of people are here to watch the launch of the Columbia Orbiter uh, in and around the area at Cape Canaveral. A lot of them, people who live in this area or have driven a long ways to see it, 
Then there is a kind of VIP section as well, a combination of politicians and celebrities of one kind or another, a lot of prominent guests from the contractors who helped build the system. We have Bob Bazell standing down in that area with a, a governor who has talked about launching his own space satellite from his state. That's Governor Jerry Brown of California. Bob? Good morning, Tom. Yeah, this, here, this is the VIP area where people who NASA invite uh, get to watch the launch. With me is Governor Jerry Brown. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. What, what about your own space satellite or space launches in California? Well, we're going to have some use of a satellite for emergency uh, communication. We have a, a great risk in California of a catastrophic earthquake, and the only real way to provide on-the-spot uh, communication is with a satellite hookup, and we'll be uh, working on that very soon. There's been a lot of criticism of the shuttle as, as being perhaps unnecessary and kind of display of technology that we really don't need. What do you think about that? I think that's utter nonsense. Uh, America is a leader in space. We have to continue and even expand, otherwise we will become a second-rate nation. Uh, this technology doesn't depend on cheap labor, it doesn't depend on wrecking the environment, but rather is a uh, window uh, and a step uh, into the larger environment, uh, which is the solar system itself. And for communication, for resource monitoring, uh, for defense, uh, this is absolutely vital. And I would like to see a much greater commitment uh, by the private sector as well as the government to develop our space uh, potential. What do you think of the Reagan administration's attitude towards the space program so far? Well, there, there are some positive signs, but uh, on balance, it's still uh, very inadequate. Uh, the space budget is one-third of what it was under John Kennedy, and it's less than the interest uh, on the national debt for one year. It's ridiculous. Do you think your satellite's going to go up in the shuttle? The California satellite? Well, the, the satellite that I wanted to buy for California will go up, but it will now be owned either by the military uh, or by uh, a, an agency of the federal government. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Now back to John Chancellor. Thank you, Governor Edmund G. Brown, Jr. of California, talking about space. He's a big fan of space, says it doesn't hurt the environment, and it's good for the soul of the country as well as science. The hold is still on here, the planned and scheduled hold in the countdown. It'll run about five more minutes, and after that, we'll be back. And then things will happen here very rapidly, and launch is still, as of now, scheduled for 10 minutes of 7, or 10 minutes before the next hour. And we'll be back with more coverage of the space launch after this. NBC's coverage of the first space shuttle will continue in a moment. You want to know how to have a great date on Broadway? Pick a play with a brilliant script. You look like you're in real great shape. On a scale of 1 to 10, I should show up on the chart any minute now. A play that will make you laugh. I just saw something that could warp my young mind. A comedy that will touch your heart. Remember going all the way. Best date on Broadway. See Richard Thomas in 5th of July. Call charge for tickets. See 5th of July at the New Apollo Theater. Off Camera with Donahue, the show behind the show. You have to help, you have a gray hair. Audiences don't just happen. The people in our office make up an outrageously creative production team. Okay, please don't yell at me in front of all the people. He has so much energy, he's always walking and always moving. What you want to do is take what energy you get and try and build it. It's controversial and it's ready. It's ready to go. Donahue, ready to go, weekdays at 9. It's the heart of New York City. It's more. The Bronx and Stony Brook. It's more. The Meadowlands and West Park. It's more. Art Slope and Sandy Hook. It's for New York. You know all the places. It's for New York. You never miss a spot. It's for New York. We cover the bases. It's for New York. We know where it's time.
back with our coverage of the launch of the Columbia Space Shuttle from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral. We're in a planned hold right now, but a small glitch has developed, it turns out. We were just told that a light has come on indicating that there's an improper level in fuel cell three. Now, there's the possibility that they may go into a 50-minute hold to fix the problem if that becomes necessary. Joe Kerwin's our astronaut with us here at the NBC News desk covering all this. Joe, what's fuel cell three? Uh, the fuel cells are the makers of electricity for the shuttle. There are three of them. Uh, you can perform a launch or anything with, with two, but we're not going to lift off unless we have all three. The fuel cell's functioning, but as near as I can tell, when they went to full power on that fuel cell, they got an indication of a high pH, which may indicate a little in, in, internal leak within the fuel cell. It also could be a sensor problem. Uh, it stayed on about two minutes and then went off. They're uh, checking the fuel cell out and uh, will decide whether they need to purge the fuel cell or whether they can proceed. All right. Let's talk for just a few moments about what happens when launch does occur, and it still looks as if it will this morning. Uh, maybe now not at 6.50 a.m. as we've been talking about. May, may be delayed a little bit. Yeah. But one of the things that I think our viewers ought to be aware of on this launch is that Yesterday, I called it from both of you, said that's a little strong. It, it takes a kind of a radical move, though, when it, when it leaves the launch pad, doesn't it? A lot of people are going to say something's wrong if they're not prepared for that. Uh, I don't know how dramatic it'll look, it'll look on, the, uh, on the screen, but, of course, the thing takes off facing south, and as soon as it clears the tower, you want to begin to roll it so that the orbiter is pointed in the direction that it's going, which is northeast. And at the same time, you begin to pitch it over. Uh, uh, we're going to go to John Chancellor okay. right now. Joe, we've got an update on something here, I think. Uh, we were just told by launch control that they are extending the hold slightly. Okay. Uh, that they, and then they repeated what you were just talking about. They, uh, little, maybe it's the light, maybe it's not, right. funny indications. They're making an assessment and they say they'll be able to tell it soon. So that if you're keeping a clock on this thing at home, uh, the thing to do is to keep your clock stopped because extending the hold as of this time means that it will not go at 10 minutes before the hour, but it may go five minutes later on schedule. It may be later than that. If they have to bring those arms back, Joe, and they have to uh, go back inside and get a, what I would call a repairman in there to have a look at this, uh, that would take us quite a long time to do it, wouldn't it? I suspect that if we had to get physical hands-on access to the fuel cell, we would not launch today. Okay. okay. So it's we would delay. buried in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. Hard to get it's at. It's deep in the mid-fuselage, uh, mid but uh, I still have vibes that it's not going to be that, that big of a problem. Okay. Well, anyhow, we were talking just a moment ago about what happened on takeoff. And, right. And it, and it goes, it right. turns over. They turn right. over. So you'll hear the call. Tower clear, roll program started, pitch program started and of course accelerating all the time. It's a fairly gentle, low rate sort of a thing. Uh, what's exciting to the crew at liftoff is that when those big solids come on, those thrust echoes from the ground and from all that structure around the pad, and it shakes that vehicle pretty good for about three seconds. For the first full minute of the flight, you have what you call max Q. We may be hearing something about that in which the which the whole structure undergoes its greatest stress. Uh, well, actually, max Q is a point in the flight, about right. 45 seconds in. When the dynamic pressure or friction of the air builds up to a peak, you kind of burst through it. You go supersonic, and then you get into the rapidly thinning upper atmosphere. Uh, max Q has vibrations and uh, uh, wind stresses on the wings and tail of the orbiter associated with it. In fact, the, the orbiter control surfaces, the airplane surfaces, undergo a programmed series of maneuvers there to unload them. All right, John, uh, yes, one of the things that's going on now is that uh, the astronauts are talking to their, their control. And let's listen to that for just a second. Houston, you may not understand it all, but it's quite interesting Perfect. to listen to. Houston verifies we have NSB-1. Joe, if you have any comments at this point, just break in. OK. There's okay, it. Now, uh, CDR, I'd like for you to take uh, CPC-5. Back at CPC. Back her up. They're still working to resolve that backup computer right, problem. Now, give me an IO reset on primary. And give me a verbal when you do it. Okay, I'll reset. This is shuttle launch control. An announcement follows in 30 seconds. <clears throat> 
so we have not only the fuel cell problem, but we still have an unresolved problem of, I'm going to call them instructions or memory instead of software, uh, going to one of the computers. <coughs> and we're expecting an announcement in a few seconds now. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus nine minutes and holding. Uh, we are presently holding past the normal time in which we would pick up the countdown uh, because of a problem with the number three fuel cell. A troubleshooting uh, team is working on that fuel cell at the present time to determine whether or not the excess water production by the fuel cell is a problem. We expect to have an announcement in a couple of minutes about that. At the present time, all other elements of the launch team appear to be ready to support the launch. The only problem being with the number three fuel cell. We're standing by to await the results of an analysis of that problem. This is shuttle launch control. Could I just say, could we see the picture of the, of the capsule again that you're seeing on your screens? The one, not the capsule, the whole arrangement. Just to, just to orient you at home, the, the great big thing that looks like the, uh, the top of a Moorish cathedral is, the, um, is one of the fuel tanks. That's full of liquid hydrogen and oxygen, highly volatile stuff. The small thing that looks like a rocket that, that you see in the foreground that looks as though it's attached to the external tank is the solid fuel rocket booster. And that's a great big thing. Nothing that big has ever been sent into space before with solid fuel. And then to the left of these two structures or fuel tanks, you see the, when there's a better view, now you can see the wings of the orbiter itself. Right. That's the orbiter, and they're up on the flight deck, the two astronauts. The whole thing looks like the um, castle for Princess Leia in Star Wars, you see it from that point of view. To me, it doesn't. We'll be back. We're in a small hole right now, but we'll be back with more coverage from Cape Canaveral and the launch of the Columbia Space Shuttle after this. The status of the one shot, I guess we're still thinking probably the best course of action to take the BFS down and Time now. Place any road USA. Action. Creation of a new personal sport coupe. Ford EXP. The bringing together of you and a beautiful package of world-class technologies. An interior thoughtfully contoured for your driving pleasure. Carefully instrumented to keep you informed. With handling and road command that come from front-wheel drive and four-wheel independent suspension. And EXP's a two-plus. Personal, practical. With room for two-plus your gear. Room for two-plus a lot of room for a lot of living. With a shape so subtle it frightens the wind. And built with Ford's commitment to quality. Tomorrow is here. The 1982 EXP from the world of Ford. Here in the sea, billions of years ago, life began an odyssey that will reach across space and time. I'm Arthur C. Clarke, speaking for Omni Magazine. I know that even the sea is not eternal, but the life it spawned will survive, for man's destiny lies among the stars in the endlessly unfolding universe of Omni Magazine. Omni, the multi-award winning magazine of science, fact, and fiction, on sale now, everywhere. Okay, I'm beautiful. Now, on to the party. Well, I want proof of this. No, you don't. We're late already. Don't worry. This is the world's fastest developing color. You see, it's the seconds now, not minutes. Well, there's your proof. Go on. Get it all out of your system. The Time Zero One Step and Time Zero Super Color Film are made for each other. That's why they both come in Polaroid's new Made for Each Other pack. Feel better now? Okay, let's go. You taking that to the party? Why not? I'm taking you. Made for each other. Right now, it's about 12 minutes before 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and we were scheduled to have a launch in about two minutes. We're not going to have one at that time here at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral with the Columbia Space Shuttle located directly behind us because they're in a hole. They've got a problem officially described by the NASA spokesman here as a fuel cell three. Apparently, they have excess water production, a team of troubleshooters now at work on that. 
simultaneously we are hearing discussion of another problem that they had earlier in this hour, and that has to do with the backup computer on board not listening to the four primary computers, or at least two of them. So what they have done is dump out the software, they call it, the memory or instructions, as John Chancellor calls it, and they're going to reload that backup computer and see if it then begins to listen properly. And that's part of the process that we believe that they're still in at this time. So the scheduled launch of the Columbia shuttle has been delayed, at least momentarily. We're not sure how long as they continue to work officially on that one problem and deal with the computer. Tom, I think this reminds us that the uh, Columbia is the most complicated and sophisticated vehicle man has ever produced. It's got so many different systems in it, and a couple of them are worthy of discussion, shall we say, at the moment, and they've got a problem with one, fuel cell number three, producing excess water, as far as we can tell right now, a, a problem that if they have to go and solve it, will delay the launch today. Roy Neal is at, uh, in the Houston, the Johnson Space Center there. I think Roy can add a little light to this problem, can you? Well, I'm not sure at all, John, because uh, in this case, I have with me Jerry Wheeler, who's a senior engineer for Rockwell, prime contractor on this machine. The reason I'm a, I'm a little in doubt is that like the astronauts and like Mission Control, we are sitting here trying to second guess an unknown situation. The unknown situation being, of course, what in the world is really wrong with fuel cell three? Why is it turning out too much water? Now, I can show you here in our uh, flight simulator pretty much what they're looking at, and we'll be monitoring. Here's an, here's an announcement from Mission Control, from Launch Control. Or it should be an announcement from Launch Control. This is shuttle Launch Control Rolling. at T-minus nine minutes and holding. At the present time, we are in the process of dumping the program, which is in the backup flight computer. It's called the backup flight software, and uh, are going to uh, re-enter that program into the computer. Uh, we had thought that this particular problem had gone away, but apparently uh, it had not. And uh, we are also continuing to look at the problem with the uh, number three fuel cell. The problem with the fuel cell appears to be that the uh, production of water is higher than it normally should be. Uh, and the problem with the backup computer may well be solved with the reprogramming of it. The, it's approximately a seven-minute operation, and we have about uh, 45 minutes remaining in our hold capability at this time. So the countdown stands at T-minus nine minutes and holding. This is shuttle launch control. Well, translated, uh, that means they will try to launch. Uh, translated, that means they, they still have plenty of time left in, in plan, built in hold time, but they'll try to launch within the hour from what I was hearing here, Jerry. Now, I'd like to show something. When they are recomputing, this is the area that the pilot right. Bob Crippen or the commander John Young would work with. This is where you program your computer. Right. And up here is where they're reading out the various details of those fuel cells. So they're obviously working with that portion of their control room. They're con on the flight deck at this time. And Jerry, uh, if they can't get that fuel cell to give correct readings, what would happen to our launch today? Well, they won't launch with just two fuel cells. They will, uh, they would probably have to delay the launch if they can't get the fuel cell to check out. That once they get up into orbit, there's no problem. Uh, it's just like with flying aircraft, uh, you have those things you can do in once you're in flight, but you're not allowed to take off until, you know, unless they're all working. And of course, so. that spacecraft is now on top of the stack. The stack is ready to go, and obviously they can't go in and make a fix. So what they can do instead is see whether or not a sensor is bad. In other words, right. if they're getting false readings on these meters. Or can they, when, when they talk about purging a fuel cell, what do you do to purge a fuel cell? Well, the, uh, the crew will do that. And uh, this is something that in flight they'll be doing. They get rid of the excess water that they uh, build up uh, from the fuel cells. As you know, they're liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. And uh, you have to go in every once in a while and, and clean out the excess moisture. So that's about what they would do here. Uh, I would like to also point out, though, in addition to just the crew working right now, you also have all those uh, engineers over in the uh, Mission Control Center. 
they all have their consoles. They're looking at the, uh, at the fuel cells. They're looking at temperatures, pressures, and they'll do the troubleshooting in, along with the crew that's in the module. According to my watch, Jerry, we should be getting some kind of results here in about another three or four minutes as to just how serious this problem seems to be and whether or not it might cause a postponement of the launch for today. Now, they're not in such bad shape that they couldn't reschedule for tomorrow no, in an event like no. this, are they? You could, well, again, I, I, I can't speculate. I don't know exactly what the problem is. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but assuming that it's, it, it is a normal fuel cell three problem, of excessive water production, they do have to go in and take a look at it and make a fix. What then would be your guess as to how long we would be looking at? Well, if they, if they actually had to uh, go in and, and get at the fuel cell, it would certainly be at least one day. There'd be no doubt about that. But uh, there's a lot you can do without actually going and having hands-on maintenance. Uh, so they'll probably, they'll probably get it fixed. All right. I want to tune in here for a moment and listen to these astronauts because they are working now with mission control. And uh, attempt on retrieval and parallel with dump uh, data review. All right. They're talking about DAP. That's the this digital autopilot. Control. An announcement follows in 30 seconds. That's Hugh Harris in launch control telling us that 30 seconds from now we'll be able to hear from him what the latest is and what the latest is of course is strictly a question mark at this time a question mark because of dual problems all small as a matter of fact that's another point jerry we have a brand new machine it's the first time this thing's been tried i guess it would have been unusual if it had launched right on time wouldn't it I fly in C-141s out of Norton Air Force Base in Reserves, and every time we go out to the airplane, we have a series of minor problems, and that's an airplane we've been flying for years. Uh, here's that announcement right now. Cat, which was the number three fuel cell, has been determined uh, to be satisfactory at this time, and it appears that we will be able to go ahead with the countdown uh, from the standpoint of the fuel cells. However, we are...